intro, Tracy. Um, as she told you, I'm Allison, and I'm here to talk about Civil War quilts. And this is my first time being at the Wapaka Historical Society, but I've talked to the Guild and I talked at the library. So I've been over here a couple of times already and kind of even recognize a few faces. So you're not that far from my neck of the woods. Um, it's such an interesting part of the state because there's so much history here that's related to Civil War stuff, and I'll try to touch on that as I go through. So um, a little bit about how I got into this. I'm from L.A. I grew up 10 minutes from the Rose Bowl. And while we do a lot of stuff around Spanish and Mexican history in L.A., we don't really talk much about the Civil War. In 1992, my husband got a job at UWO, and we left Southern California, and we moved to Oshkosh. And then we moved to Berlin. And I lived two blocks from Nathan Strong Park, which is the pretty park with the bandstand that you drive by. And we live in a house that's more than 100 years old in a neighborhood full of houses that are at least that old, if not older. And there's this incredible monument in the park that looks like it was put up last week because the texture of the stone is so incredibly shiny. There's no erosion. It looks like someone just sat down and carved it within the last month. I mean, the thing is incredible. And of course, it's the monument from the GAR that was erected just after the Civil War. So I'm immersed in this stuff. It's in my neighborhood where I walk my dogs all the time. I'm, I'm living in history, and people started bringing stuff to my shop. Oh, we're cleaning out the barn, and we found this trunk, and here's this thing. And some of the things I knew right away what they were. They were 1930s, that era, very easy to recognize. But then there was the, oh, we found these in the linen closet, and we think these were from great grandma Sophie, and she died in 1900. And they're kind of spinning out, and so I'm looking at stuff that I know is very old. So I decided that I better study up and learn a whole lot about fabric and history. And here we are today in 2018 where I do know a lot, and I'm going to share some of that with you. So um, please go ahead and interrupt me while I'm talking, because I'm afraid if we wait till the end, we won't get all the questions answered. We might as well just do it as we go along. And I'm going to need a couple helpers. I need a couple quilt holders. So if you want to come and hold quilts for me, that would be wonderful. And that way, I don't have to try to hide behind the quilt and talk at the same time. <laughs> so I'll just point out the image that's on the screen. I was very fortunate in November, uh, we were down by my husband's people in Danville and we drove over to Indy. There was a fabulous exhibit at the Indiana State Museum called Lincoln and Quilts. And it wasn't a huge exhibit. I think there were probably maybe 40 items all told, but every single one of them had firm provenance to the Lincoln family or to like their next door neighbor or their cousin or their, I mean, they were all closely linked. And the thing that's shown here was their shoemaker. The wife of Lincoln's shoemaker made this quilt while she was waiting for her husband to return from the war in the early years. She made it in 1862. And if you look right down here at the bottom, there's her crossed flags to show her support for the union. You know, women couldn't get up in public and talk about their support for things. That was not encouraged. But what we see is it shows up in their quilts. And this woman, whose name was Julia, certainly told us what side she was on. So, and we can go on to the next one. So just to kind of refresh your memory, here's a little timeline for you. Go back 150 plus years now. Lincoln's elected in November. In December, South Carolina secedes, followed by a whole bunch more in very quick succession. The Union Army calls for an enrollment of men, volunteers, in March of 1861, and he called up 20,000 guys. He thought that that would be enough to deal with it. Well, Fort Sumter was attacked in 1861. The South won. And the thing that always is heartbreaking whenever I read the period literature 
is how awful things were on both sides. This thing was a giant mess. When I read about all the maneuvers and what everyone was doing, it's obvious that for a big part of the war, nobody knew what was going on. And it was sort of anybody's guess as to how a given battle might go. The supply lines were so difficult um, at the beginning of the war, just getting supplies to the men was hard. So, you know, this was a really, really difficult and tragic period in our country's history. Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation and freed the slaves in 1862. Um, and there's more story there, but we're not going to go there. And then at Gettysburg, we can finally see the pendulum swing more firmly to the Union side in 1863. But you know, we dithered on till 1865. So anyway, five days later, five days, and Lincoln is assassinated and is you know, dead six days later. Incredible. Poor man. So that's the overview, the framework that we're working in. You can go ahead and. And I, I have been astounded to learn in my studies how important Wisconsin actually was on the Western Front in terms of um, creating and mobilizing supplies for the troops. For a small state that was fairly new in the Union, we pumped massive amounts of goods into Chicago and from then on down the Mississippi into supplies for the Western Front. And I'll try to give you a couple specific examples from areas that you know. This is the actual, um, what's carved on the monument in our park. I photographed it and then reversed it and I made an applique out of some of it for a thing we did a while ago. And it's got all the symbols of the different branches of the service, and I love being able to read it like this. It, you know, it was hard to see when it was um, white on red, but in black and white you can see it. And of course, I'm pretty sure you know who those guys are over there. You know who they are? And with the with their mascot, uh huh, old Abe. And I, I talked at the, um, the, the Civil War Museum down in Kenosha last year, and I said, and you know, the big secret is Abe was a girl. <laughs> but after I got all done, the curator there came up and said, you know, I need to just correct one really small thing. Two of the historical societies here went together and they paid to have DNA testing done on old oh. Abe. <laughs> <laughs> Who is stuffed and is in the Capitol building? Well, Abe was a boy. They thought Abe was a girl because it's so big. And normally the females are bigger. But I guess maybe Abe got fed a lot when he wasn't busy circling around the battlefield. So here's our guys in their very um, distinctive gear with those hats that were not like anybody else's hats. So let me show you some quilts. I'm going to start with some pieces that were made just before the war uh, so that you can kind of get an idea of what the color palette's doing and how things change when we get into the war years. This is one quarter of a piece that would have had four identical blocks. And this is a piece from about 1850. So when we think dull, drab, boring, no. And the arrangement of colors that are in this piece she may very well have worn these things together because their fashion sense was not like ours and stripes and plaid went together and some of the color combinations are enough to set your teeth on edge. <laughs> but it's a terrific example of this chrome yellow which does have the metal chrome in the dye. This is turkey red which is incredibly color fast. You can see how bright it is after all these years. You can boil turkey red and it basically doesn't change color. And then most of the blues on here you'll notice are kind of a warm blue. These are Prussian blues. Prussian blue was one of the very first mineral or artificial dyes, a dye not made from a plant. Um, it was uh, made from a coal derivative. And it's a warm blue that opened up a whole new blue spectrum for fabric. So um, you can pass this around if you want. Everything that I brought tonight can be handled, dropped on the floor. They are teaching pieces. That's what they're meant for. You know, it's fine with me if you touch my quilts. 
So this is the palette of the years just before the war. Let's go ahead and click. Now I need my holders. Because I want you to see what was just before. Uh, there's uh, some cheddar orange in that center stripe, yeah. Uh -huh. And there's more cheddar on here. You can see in those urns. Okay. Um, I love this piece. This was my birthday present to myself a couple years ago. And the only reason that I won it is that the eBay auction for this piece ended during the school day. A lot of quilt collectors are teaching professionals and they don't get home until after 3.30 or 4. And the auction on this ended at 1.30 in the afternoon, and I sat there, and I just kept pushing the button. <laughs> so it came in at a price that I could afford. But I love it for several different reasons. I love the design work. I love the little berries and the vine around the edge. I love the asymmetry of this piece. And I also love the fact that it's losing its color, because it shows us how the greens were made. They're called fugitive greens. And they're done in two steps. And there was a kind of buffy yellow underlayer and a more bluish overlayer. And the blue is light sensitive. So over time, you, you, you lose the blue. And it goes first from being green to being sort of tealy. And then you lose the teal and you end up with tan. So if you ever see an old quilt that's tan and red, probably used to be green, although there are some that actually were tan. A great example here, the pattern is a variation on Carolina Lily. It's probably a northern quilt. Um, it's, it's thin, lots of quilting. The designs are more similar to northern pieces of this period than they are to southern pieces, which tend to be thicker, a little more folky, and there's a quilting difference that I'll show you later on. And that's, that's just, we can't know. I don't know who made this, but that's my guess. And then what we did was we got this table over here, and we can just stick them over there. Well, and um, Yeah, sure. I figured that way if they want to look at anything in particular, they can get a second look. What did you pay for it? You know, I'm not being evasive. I really don't remember. What I can tell you is the most I paid for any of the pieces I brought today was $275. Because I'm, you know, they're not collector pieces. I'm not a collector. So I don't, I'm not about condition. I'm about what can this piece teach us. So I'm, I'm definitely on the bottom feeding end of the spectrum. <laughs> I like to rescue those ones they're advertising as cutters. You know, some of them have come home to live at my house. You know, in the, in the beginning, I thought I was going to fix them. So, yeah, no, not happening. So the war broke out. And there were pretty immediate impacts that occurred that affected people's lives um, across the United States, north and south. The embargoes and blockades went into place. So essentially, shipping stopped in the southern states. Cotton production was affected because they couldn't get supplies they needed to grow cotton. And also because as the word got out that something was going on, more of the slave labor began to leave the farms. If they were able to, they would leave and try to get into the North because they had heard that Lincoln was moving towards emancipation. At least this is what my readings are telling me. Inflation was a huge problem. And I looked up some numbers and just double checked. Uh, it was particularly bad in the South because they made a decision to print their own currency, but it wasn't much better in the North. For example, in May of 1861, a 200 pound bag of salt, which was how you preserved meat because you didn't have a freezer, 200 pounds of salt cost 65 cents. Okay? By December of 1862, so a year and a half later, that same bag, 200 pounds of salt, was $60 if you could get it. And many things ramped up a similar way. So basic goods, flour, 
salt, things that you needed to run your household escalated very sharply and became extremely expensive for the average person to try to obtain, if they could even get it. So inflation was, was tough. Household income plummeted, and this was particularly true for our Wisconsin farm women because so many of the guys enlisted and left her on the farm with the kids, and she's supposed to figure out how to do everything all by herself, where before he usually called some of the shots. Normally, she would have to learn how to budget. She would learn how to, to, how to make plans about which crops were going to be done in what series. I mean, there were a lot of things that the farm wives had to take over that were things that they might have been a player in before, but certainly weren't their full responsibility, and they took on that load. And I have some wonderful books that I love to refer to. Mary Livermore was married to the man that owned the Chicago, I think it was the Tribune, but it might have been the Herald. It was Chicago's biggest newspaper when the war broke out. And she writes about visiting Wapaka. Mm -hmm. And she writes about women out in the fields harvesting. And it's a fascinating first-hand <laughs> description. Um, this is an incredible book. If you get the chance to read it, I thought it might be kind of dull. It's not dull. It's really amazing. She travels up and down the front. She talks about the hospitals, the battlefront, what it's like to be in a war. You know, and she's wearing hoops, you know, and clambering on and off a steamboat and wearing a corset. I, I just, it's incredible. These people were so strong. But she talks about Wapaka and how women worked in the fields right here in our neck of the woods. So household incomes were really hit. And I've got this note down here about the cotton gin because oftentimes people will ask me, like, I should somehow know, but, you know, why was there a civil war? Why, why, why? Well, in doing a lot of reading, and I wrote my first paper about the civil war when I was still in college, I have become convinced that the cotton gin had an awful lot to do with it. Because before the cotton gin, cotton was not a profitable crop. It took too long to pull the seeds out of it. And I gave you the numbers that before the gin, it took a slave. One pound of cotton took 10 hours to pick the seeds out because they're so sticky. They're so enmeshed in those fibers. With the gin, three guys could do 50 pounds in that same period of time. And the gins got better as time went on. So what happened was it created a demand for labor, and it created a demand for cotton, and in the end, it cre created a growing demand across the water for baled cotton to use for fabric. Without the gin, none of that would have happened. So, you know, I think that things might have been a lot different if the cotton gin had not been invented. What we do know for sure is by 1850, we produced two-thirds of the world's cotton, with the rest coming uh, primarily from India and a few places in Europe that were warm enough to grow it, and also Egypt. We held 3.2 million slaves to produce that cotton. So it was time. It was time something needed to happen. And we can go on to the next. Pardon? Did they learn to do how to properly cotton gin? I mean, was it invented by a Negro? Oh, no, no. It's, it was invented, um, I think Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. And he was an inventor that was looking for a labor-saving device. He had figured out that it would have to have some sort of combs on it. And I don't know the whole story of that. I know more about the sewing machine. But what I do know is that he tried several other versions, and then he finally invented this thing that looks kind of like a wool carding drum. And you turn it, and you pull the fiber through it. So he invented it. He marketed it. And it sold like hotcakes. And so he went into the sale and manufacture and licensing of cotton gins which were widely copied, everybody made improvements, and so within 10, 12, 15 years, there were cotton gins all over the South. And people were trained to operate them, and that was their job, breathing in cotton dust, cotton fiber all day. Yeah, not a nice job. So you want to hold that one up for me?
This is another just before the war. This is probably right about 1855. And this is what's called a four blocker. This was a very common design mode just before the war. You'll see it's kind of uh, simple, a little more folky than the last piece we looked at. Four repeated designs. It's got these great big turkey red shapes with lots of rosebuds. Little stars. And for those of you who are quilters, the slits in the big red things are, are channel applique, where she's made a slit and turned it in, so it's like reverse applique. And I think the stars are also giving us a little bit of a clue, because any kind of stars tended to signify a union supporter. There aren't a lot of stars on southern quilts. And where there are stars on southern quilts, they tend to be in groups that reflect the number of states that seceded. And I'm hoping at some point to have a quilt where I can show that, but I haven't found one yet. So here again, we have that incredibly tur color fast turkey red. We've got some nice cheddar orange. And this funky little print that's in here, that's an Eli and Walker calico. And it was printed until about 1954. And yes, I did say 1954. So if that was the only print fabric that you had to date the quilt from, you'd be sunk. So luckily, there's a lot of other clues in here. The quality of the hand quilting, the way the thing is pieced. And this thing is about 12 to 14 stitches to the inch. The quilting skills are incredible. And our applique is invisible. So big designs, lots of flowers, kind of um, folky feeling, traditional red and green color scheme. That's right before the war. Allison, okay. Do you know how they mark those lines, the quilting lines? Yeah, pencil. Just pencil. Yeah, just plain old pencil. Um, sometimes they would use charcoal, but they didn't like that as much because occasionally charcoal wouldn't come out. So usually it was a pencil. Mm -hmm. And what's remarkable to me, as a professional quilter who tries not to mark anything because mm -hmm. it, I'm always afraid it won't come out. The accuracy on these pieces is incredible. Um, the squares are square. They hit right on their diagonals. I mean, I do have some that are, that, are, um, that are less, but that piece in particular, and my pineapple that I'll show you in a minute, the grids are really square. Have treadle sewing machines no. been invented by now? No. Okay. No treadle. No treadle yet. I'll tell you when it was, because that's. So we're trying to gear up our union guys and get them outfitted and get them sent to where they need to be. And there were a lot of problems getting an army functioning. They had very few trained troops. They had reduced the army to a very minimal level after the Mexican War. And those guys were now 20 years older. And a lot of them really didn't want to go back and fight anymore, but some of them stepped up and took over as generals and officers. But the regular, you know, the guys that just were the regular troops, we didn't have hardly any of them trained and ready to go. So we also had no regular supply network. There were no stockpiles of uniforms. There were no stockpiles of weapons. I mean, they kind of knew something was going to happen, but they sort of didn't know how to go about getting ready for something to happen. So they had to wait until it happened and then figure out how to cope with it. And there's a lot of stuff in Mary Livermore's book about how that happened, about the mills changing production and starting to make the wool for union uniforms. And you know the fact that some of the first union wool was gray, the same colors what the Confederate officers were wearing. So they even had to sort out what color things were supposed to be in the beginning. Um, the other huge problem was disease. They were pooling all these people together. They had no sanitary anything. It was filthy dirty. Not only was everyone infested with fleas and lice, but you can imagine what the sewer situation was like. And one of the stats I ran across, during the war years, um, many more people during the war died of disease than did of wounds. There were 620,000-ish total fatalities during the Civil War, which is a huge number of people. Three out of five of the Northern troops who died 
and two out of three of the southern troops died of disease. And a lot of it was things like cholera. So even Camp Randall, which was one of the better ones because we're far enough north that at least they didn't get malaria, um, a lot of guys died of dysentery before they ever even got out of the state. So the women at home are knowing all this and having to try to cope and hoping that they get that letter that says, I'm still OK, and this is where I am. This is a period political cartoon that I got from Gettysburg College. They have a terrific online site. And it's poking fun at the training process for the new soldiers. They're all dressed up in their new uniforms, which are really tight and don't fit really well. And they're trying to march in a straight line. But my understanding is, I wasn't in marching band, but I guess you usually take your cue off the guy that's at the left-hand end. Well, in this cartoon, the left-hand end guy can't keep up. So of course, the row that he's in is never going to be a straight line. And if you want some period humor, go check that out, because there's a lot of really fun political cartoons that poke fun at how things were going on. We can go on to the next one. So Governor Randall, who was actually the second governor during the war years, he put out an appeal to the women of Wisconsin and said, as I cited up there, I know that you will respond cheerfully to my request that you contribute your aid in the present crisis in the way of preparing Linton bandages for the use of the army. And he, all, he, there were other letters where he requested other things. But that was in April of 1861, and he was already putting out a call for resources that they knew were desperately needed at the hospitals that were serving the soldiers. And the southern governments were just as adamant about asking their women to do things. Um, this particular set of slides doesn't have a lot of stuff about the south because I have to pick and choose. I can't get them all in there and show you any quilts. So <laughs> the piece that's here, though, is beginning to look a little different from the ones that I showed you. Little pieces, lots of different colors, much simpler setting. This quilt is pieced rather than applique. Uh, it's definitely a piece that was made when fabric was not as abundant as previously. Because what happened was many of the mills went out of the production of garment fabric and went into the production of goods for the war. So within just a few months after the war started, unless you lived up in New England in the mill country, the rest of the country saw a big drop in the availability of fabric for garments. And so people tended to make much more scrappy quilts during the war years. And I'm lucky enough to have a couple of those to show you. And we're going to skip the pineapple, and let's let them see this one. So this is really typical for the time during the war. It's small blocks. The only thing that's unusual here is that all that pink fabric is the same fabric. That's actually what we call a double pink. It's red printed on white, and it reads to us as pink. Lots of different garment scraps, simple block, and this actually is a summer spread. It is backed, but there is no batting. And interestingly enough, you were asking about the treadle. Well, the treadle wasn't invented until 1865. So all the machines they had were hand crank. This thing is machine quilted. If you look at it, it's not quite as straight as some of those, but it's not bad. And I'm thinking about maneuvering through the machine with your one hand while you're trying to, I mean, it's definitely one of these. <laughs> yeah. One of the machines I saw, that was a crank machine. Instead of sewing like this, you would sew like this. sideways. Oh, they had all different variations. Oh, wow. I mean, they had some where the, the head was rotated to the front, and like you said, you would sew sideways. They had some that had curved needles that looked like saber-toothed cat fangs. I mean, there were more weird sewing machines. 
But what we do know is that if she had a sewing machine, she was going to use it. And she either used it to make uniforms or she used it to do stuff like this because it was such a time saver. And I just was so lucky. I saw this and it was part of a display. It itself wasn't really out for sale. And I looked at it and I'm like, oh. So I went up and I asked the lady in charge of the booth and she said, oh, well, she's not here, but I can call her up. And I didn't pay very much for it because she didn't know what she had. So machine quilted period piece. What is the pattern name? Um, churn dash. Oh, okay. Monkey wrench is a bigger thing in the middle. Is how you tell them apart. So, I just love it. So, okay. I, I get, you know, they, they kind of woo me over and I want to talk about them. And we can go on to the next slide. <laughs> okay. And here she is with her hand crank in her period appropriate center parted hair that she washed about every two weeks. But can you see how glossy her hair is? That's the 100 strokes a night. You know, trashy romance novels do have some fascinating <laughs> bits of historical information. So I know my husband laughs, but I'm like, you know what? You'd be amazed. What? And he just laughs. So anyway, she looks she looks a little unhappy at her sewing. I kind of think maybe she needs a break. But such a great photo of a period dame in her costume, and um, the women are making stuff. They're also supplying nurses to the front. They're running the farms, and they're working in factories. And a lot of those were completely new areas for most women. And in the South, which was largely a rural economy, women suffered terribly. And when you read their own words about what was going on in their homes and on the small farms, because remember, those huge, you know, gone with the wind plantations, they were really far and few between compared to the family farm type setups. Those women suffered terribly. They pretty much had no fabric and they ended up having to upcycle and repurpose every other kind of textile in their house in order to keep people clothed. So you see clothing and quilts that are made out of drapes. The quilts get very primitive. They're usually just whole cloths. They're kind of thrown together and most of them are tied rather than quilted, and they're often stuffed with raw wool during those war years. Some actually learned how to spin again using thread that they repurposed by unweaving other textiles. Because they had no other way, they couldn't get it. It wasn't available. So uh, we can go ahead on to the next one. We were a little bit better off up in the north, and one of the reasons was that we had slightly better transportation. We had the Great Lakes. We had a better uh, ferry and steamship network because of the way the rivers and the lakes connect to each other, and we also had more railroads, and that was a biggie because it meant that we could move large quantities of stuff a little bit more quickly than they could in the south. Still. The soldier's wife, who's sitting at home with all the kids, she got whatever was left over of his $13 a month salary. And that was after he paid for whatever he had to pay for, because he had to pay for his own stuff in camp. So she got whatever was left, plus $2 a kid, if she got it. And both in Mary Livermore's book and in this fine book, written by Miss Ethel Hearn from Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. Ethel talks about the hardships of the women who would go to the war office and plead, I have nothing in my cupboards. I have six children at home who are starving, and I haven't received any of my husband's pay since he left last year. And these poor women, you know, sometimes they were able to help. And Mary Livermore talks, in fact, about the ways that once in a while they were able to intercede. But oftentimes they would just have to say, I'm really sorry, but we can't contact the paymaster, so we don't know where he is, and we don't know why your pay has been held up. 
you know, they lost their homes, they lost everything. So um, Ethel, Ethel did this as sort of a master's thesis type project. And she actually went and interviewed a lot of survivors of the Civil War years between 1890 and I think she wrote this in 1910 or something, 1911. It's called Wisconsin Women in the War Between the States. And this is another fascinating, fascinating read. I have a little quote for you, a little story about Wapaka County, which is why it's worth reading. A patriotic school teacher. The increase in the number of women who taught school during this period is not at all surprising, since some of these positions were left vacant by men who had gone to the front. And even so, they paid them less by about $5 a month. So instead of 25, they got 20 bucks. But here's a story about a woman who had spirit. About nine miles from Wapaka, a young woman taught a district school. She was devoted to the union and taught her pupils to sing patriotic songs. The school board consisted mostly of Southern sympathizers. Here in Wapaka County, isn't that interesting? who told her that such songs would never do. The next day, the children began their schoolwork by singing John Brown. <laughs> Very inflammatory ballad. John Brown's body lies a moldering in, yeah, that one, okay? That same morning, the members of the board waited upon her and informed her that she would have to choose between discontinuing the songs or closing the school. The plucky girl replied that she had a contract to teach the children were accustomed to sing in the morning and should continue to do so. On the third day, the teacher found the schoolhouse closed, but nothing daunted, she summoned the patriotic women of the neighborhood who remained at the schoolhouse until noon as her witnesses. Her next act was to call the school board and demand her salary for the whole period of her employment. They wouldn't give it to her, but fortunately a company of soldiers had come home on furlough and they insisted that justice be done. The case was at last carried to the cir circuit court where the judge rendered a verdict in her favor. So they closed the school because she wanted the kids to sing patriotic songs, hmm. but she got paid, and that was nine miles from Wapaka. So draw and ring around nine miles, and it was, she was right here, this plucky. <laughs> so. And this is fun, you can pass this around, that is, an authentic Confederate 10 cent note. The Confederacy couldn't make coinage, but you still needed fractions of dollars, so they printed paper change. <laughs> and my friend gave me that because he thought I needed to have it. The quilt that's up there, which is a symphony of double pinks, is a signature block. Every one of those things is signed in the middle, and it was made.